So let's start. Um, so I'm Thierry. I'm from Belgium. Um, land of um, chocolate, waffles, and beer. And the non enviable first place of longest period without a government. <laughs> but that worked very well because we have lots of governments, so we are quite resilient. Right. Um, this is my hometown. If you haven't seen it, go watch it at night. It's super beautiful. Um, this is on. Okay, um, I'll start by doing what I do best. It's uh, being vulnerable. Otherwise, the alternative is uh, being an imposter. So, I'm quite shy and quite introverted. Um, well, all the good things for public speaking. Isn't it? Right. Um, well, to be honest, public speaking is my worst nightmare, so I'm shaking here. And then you can wonder, well, wh why are you doing this? Well, <laughs> what can I say? Um, I actually laugh having spoken. It's like really energizing. So, that said, now I can start. So, I'm... I'm going to first introduce you to two teams, two quite different teams I've worked with in a not so recent past. So somewhere in 2012, that's quite a long time ago, I had the opportunity to start a technical coaching mission with the sole purpose to upscale the software engineering skills of a quite novice team. So really novice from an engineering perspective not really from a working experience perspective because while well, they had a working experience ranging from somewhere like five years till 20 years and um, well they just didn't have the luxury to work with people that showed them different ways of working or to attend conferences like this one so luckily i wasn't alone coaching this this uh, this team we were the two of us which is quite reassuring if you have to introduce lots of change in front of people with lots of working experience now, when we started, we discovered a situation we weren't quite expecting to still discover in 2012. Um, so no one, except for one person, was using any version control system. Yeah, right. Uh, so code was shared using shared drives, obviously. So the first thing we did was actually introducing a version control system. But because the team was novice, didn't have experience using version control systems, I thought Git would be a bridge too far. It's just too many concepts to learn. Like this, this whole idea of having a remote repository, a local repository, when you commit it's not in a remote repository, well, whoa, far too complicated. So I suggested we'll go for subversion. It's fairly simple, we only have three concepts to, uh, to master. We check out code, we modify it, we check it in simple and at the time it was said that well branching is rather difficult with subversion easier than with cvs anyone use cvs yeah but um more difficult than with git so i also suggested well look we won't use any branches at all um, and, well, to be honest, at the time, I didn't understand much about branching um, strategies. And it all seemed far too complex and far too, too complicated for my simple mind. Now, so everyone was going to commit into Trunk, and that worked pretty well, because it was a second thing we introduced right from the start, and that was the practice of continuous integration and team commitment that any change had to be um, covered by an automated test and preferably an, uh, a, a unit test. Now at the time I didn't realize this way of working was a valid branching strategy and that it actually had a name. It took me several years to find out this was called trunk based development. Now was trunk never broken? Well, yes, it happened. A bit more often than actually good, remember, it's a novice team. But it wasn't really a problem because we had continuous integration in place um, that allowed us to uncover the problems quite early and that allowed us to fix them 
while they were still small um, and easily to fix. Now, after a year or two, we thought like, yeah, now the team is mature enough, has enough confidence in using version control systems, it's time to migrate to Git. And the main driver was, well, first of all, there is more tooling available to manage Git repos, but more importantly, we wanted to introduce the pull request model for code reviews, and so we wanted to be able to create branches more easily. But what works for the open source world, where we have a core team that maintains a system and accepts outside contributions, doesn't necessarily work very well for a co-located team inside a corporate environment. So, like with all powerful tools, there are many ways you can use them, not all of them are good. And the fact that um, proponents of distributed version control systems use feature branching to sell distributed version control systems, together with all the tooling that exists around distributed version control systems, well, makes everyone blind for all the problems that are introduced by feature branching. And we've hit those problems quite hard. It was rather painful. And we've tried to solve those problems by introducing ever more complex technology and ever more complex uh, processes, but it never really solved the problem. And in the end, well, we had more complexity. And so we sat down um, together to discuss the matter, and then we decided to let go on feature branching and go back to what worked for us, and that was string based development. And we never looked back. And that was one of the best decisions we've taken. And interestingly, while well, somewhere in 2020, like eight years later, I was invited to give this exact talk at that same organization, and I learned that the team was still practicing uh, trunk based development, and they j didn't question it. it. It was like the most normal thing to do. Now, after that mission, somewhere in 2016, I had the opportunity to collaborate with a totally different organization, quite agile, working with highly skilled engineers, where everyone was working almost full-time in pair, but they decided as an organization to adopt GitFlow as a branching strategy. Oh my. So when I arrived, branches were living from somewhere five days to 30 days. And so people were spending much non-valuable time in rebasing mainline into their branch, fixing merge conflicts, doing rework. So when I saw this, I was like, and, and with my experience working with this, this novice team, I suggested, well, shouldn't we try out an experiment with string based development? And at the time, a, a, a new project was going to start where only two team members would work on. Um, so it wouldn't be very riskful. Well, trying to convince people of the benefits of string based development is really not an overnight task. It's quite painful and it requires quite a lot of energy. Especially when you suggest that um, in front of um, experienced, skilled engineers. So they, every time I have the same reaction. So people stare at me like, like I'm an idiot. What are you saying? The whole industry is using some sort of branching strategy. It's one of the most accepted practices. And you are just suggesting that everyone is going to commit directly into mainline? It's going to be a mess. We will have merge conflicts all over the place. So, although trunk based development is um, implied by <coughs> continuous integration, although trunk based development um, is reported since 2015 by the State of DevOps report as predicting higher IT delivery performance, and although um, trunk based development is practiced by organizations like Facebook, like Microsoft, Netflix, and Google at an extremely large scale. So at Google in 2016, we were speaking about 25,000 engineers working on a single trunk with 16,000 changes per day. It is still one of the most um, controversial practices in the IT industry, and still nowadays. Um, and so I failed. I miserably failed in trying to get this organization to run an experiment with string-based development. And I failed because I lacked 
the right arguments because I only had this one experience with this one novice team. Although in my past career I used quite some branching strategies, but I never really paid attention to the problems that arise from using branches. So I took the opportunity to observe what happens, and this resulted in this presentation. Now, before we move on, I want to introduce some definitions, or reiterate some definitions. And I'm sure, well, you know these things, you know these practices, but as it often happens in our industry, people like to redefine practices so they match their way of working and so people can tell we practice those practices. So first of all, what is mainline? So mainline is the line of development that acts as the reference from where builds are created and that feed into your deployment pipeline. So for Git, this is mainline. For Mercurial, this is the, the default branch. And for Subversion and CVS, this is string. What is feature branching? Well, feature branching is a practice where people do not merge their code back into mainline until the feature they are working on is done. But not yet done done. So done means it is death complete, but there is still a lot of work to be done before that feature gets into production. So first of all, a new build has to be created, automated tests has to be executed, um, then uh, manual testing needs to, needs to happen, um, eventually load testing, performance testing, and security testing needs to happen, and then we can deploy into production. And then we have to run the smoke test, and then we can release to the end users. When we've done all of this, the feature is done done. So with feature branching, the implementation of a feature starts by the creation of a, of a branch. The feature grows on the branch. When the feature is done, it goes through a gating process called a code review. When it goes successfully through the gating process, it gets merged back into mainline, and, it gets into, and, and then it follows its train. So when we speak about feature branching, we really mean long-running branches, branches that live longer than a day. What is continuous integration? Well, it's a practice where everyone in the team integrates their work frequently into mainline, at least once a day, leading to multiple integrations per day for the whole team. And every integration is validated by an automated build. Um, so it's a practice that ensures always working software on mainline. And um, that gives us feedback within minutes on whether a change broke the application or not. So, and this involves that everyone in the team commits at least once a day into mainline. Every commit triggers an automated build and execution of the automated uh, tests. And whenever the build fails, it gets fixed within 10 minutes. Now, the easiest way to fix a broken build is just to revert the last failing commit and go back to the last known good state. Now, for continuous integration, we don't need much tooling. Um, James Shaw wrote a quite funny article about this. It's called Continuous Integration on a Dollar a Day. And the only thing you need is a version control system, an automated build, a crappy build computer, a silly toy, and team commitment to never break the build. That's it. And lastly, what is the goal of an organization? Well, the goal of any organization is to actually make money. And to achieve that, we need to sustainably minimize the lead time to create positive business impact. And lead time is the clock wall time between we, as a team, as an idea. That idea is implemented, deployed into production, and released to the end user. And positive business impact is anything that either generates money, this is turnover, saves money, this is cost reductions, or protects money. And this is being ahead of our competition. Now, we want to reduce this lead time because we want to accelerate feedback. We want to know as fast as possible if the thing we have just designed, implemented, and released to the users is actually being used by the user and how it is being used by the user. And based on that, on, uh, that on information, we can take new decisions and run new experiments to find new unmet needs of our customers and find new ways to delight our customers, which is a huge competitive advantage. Now, before I could ever suggest string-based development again to people, I had to understand why teams are using feature branches. Which problems are they trying to solve with feature branches? 
And so I asked around, I asked proponents of feature branching for their reasons, and they shared several with me, and I'm going to share four of them with you. So the first one was, well, it allows us to work in isolation, and therefore we are more productive. And I have to admit, the first time I heard this, I was like, yes, of course, makes total sense. But then I, I started to think over this, and I was like, yeah, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. This looks like a local optimization. We are optimizing for individual developer productivity. But designing IT systems is rarely an individual activity. So most of the time it is a team activity. So the team goes only as fast as the slowest merge. As long as we haven't merged back, well, we simply do not know how much work is left to do because of potential merge conflicts and potential rework that will happen at merge time. And so integrating changes becomes very time consuming and very unpredictable. And as a result, our IT delivery process becomes unpredictable, which will um, increase our lead time and our time to market. Remember, the goal of our organization is to um, sustainably reduce the lead time to create positive business impact. So to make money and to generate feedback. And here we're doing the exact opposite. So instead of optimizing for developer productivity, well, we should optimize for team productivity and adopt a team-oriented branching strategy like training-based development. The second reason I received was, um, well, every refactoring goes nowhere. We can just delete it. And again, when I heard this, I was like, yeah, makes sense. And then I started thinking about it. I was like, yeah, but well, wait. Um, what I think they are trying to say here is, well, we have this problem. We don't know the solution right away. So we're just trying something by committing code into a branch, hoping somewhere we will get to a solution. And if we don't, well, no problem. We just delete the branch. Now, to be honest, I still have to see the first team that is uh, willing to delete a one week or more than one week work. Just say. Um, so, if we don't know the solution right away, why don't we spike out some ideas? And this is the purpose of a spike. It's to write throwaway code to test out an idea. And the output of a spike is not production code. It's actually knowledge. We are creating knowledge. And so after a couple of hours, well, we should know if an idea worked out or not. If it didn't work out, no problem. Just throw away the code and start over again and try another idea. If it did work out, well, great. We found a solution to our problem. Again, we're going to throw away our code and start over again. But this time, we are going to implement the solution in small incremental steps using the knowledge we've just created during that spike. <coughs> the third reason I received was, well, it allows us to control the quality of what goes into production. Because, well, only features that went successfully through a gating process called the code review are merged back into mainline and deployed into production. Now, isn't controlling the quality of features the exact purpose of having continuous integration and continuous delivery in place? <coughs> so the objective of continuous integration and by extension um, continuous delivery is to eliminate bad release candidates as soon as possible. And only changes that went successfully through all stages of the deployment pipeline and that have been thoroughly tested get deployed into production. So in my humble opinion, this is the most effective way to control quality and not a manual gating process like a code review. And lastly, it allows us to control which feature goes into production and which not. Or more precisely, it allows us to prevent that unfinished functionality goes into production because unfinished functionality is sitting on the branch. As long as the branch is not merged back, it doesn't get into production. Now, what we are actually doing here is using our version control system to turn features off and on using um, via uh, manual merging. 
And this is nothing else than a poor man's modular architecture. So instead of using our version control system to, uh, as a manual toggling mechanism, well, we should design our systems in such a way that we can turn features off and on during deploy time or runtime. Right. Now, why are feature branches a problem? Well, first of all, it delays feedback. As long as we haven't merged back into mainline, we simply do not know if our changes broke the application or not. It's only the minute that we merge back into mainline that continuous integration process is triggered. Now, this delay in feedback increases with the uh, duration of our branch and with the number of parallel branches that exist. So if our branch lives for a couple of hours, feedback is delayed for a couple of hours. If the branch lives for a couple of days, feedback is delayed for a couple of days. Remember, continuous integration is this practice that ensures always working software on mainline and that gives us feedback within minutes on whether a change broke the application or not. Now, lots of teams like to redefine continuous integration by saying, well, look, we have GitLab CI running against all of our branches, you know. <coughs> well, having an automated build running against all of our branches is actually a really, really good thing. But it's not continuous integration. We are not integrating. The only feedback that we receive is that the code that exists inside the isolated <coughs> branch still compiles and that we haven't introduced any regressions against the tests that exist inside the branch. We do not know how this code integrates with all the other code that exists on all the other parallel branches. So from this moment on, CI doesn't stand for continuous integration but stands for continuous isolation. We are not integrating um, outside uh, changes and the rest of the team simply do not know how our changes will affect their work. If we are developing multiple features at the same time, in parallel, each on their branch, integrating these features together becomes exponentially harder with the number of features that are being developed in parallel and the number of, number of changes that are required to implement the features. Now, one way to solve this integration problem is to adopt something that Martin Fowler calls promiscuous integration. Now be aware, Martin doesn't advise promiscuous integration, he just named the pattern. Or shall we say an anti-pattern. Um, so in order to use a change from another branch, we are going to cherry pick commits from one branch into, a, uh, into our branch. And so what we are essentially doing here is communicating changes between branches. Now the biggest concern Martin has against promiscuous integration is, well, apart from the fact that we are introducing quite some process complexity, is that we lose track on who has what on which branch. Now compare this complexity with the simplicity of having everyone in the team committing directly into mainline multiple times a day and as such communicating changes with the whole team and as such creating a shared understanding and a collective ownership of the code base which will inevitably have a positive impact on uh, code quality and, and on throughput. As long as we haven't merged back into mainline, the rest of the team simply do not know in which direction we are taking the code in order to implement the feature we are working on. Now, this is okay as long as everyone on the team is working on different code base areas. But the minute that two team members are working on the same code base area, well, they are each blind on how their work will affect the other person. On the other hand, if we are committing frequently into mainline while we are communicating with the rest of the team the direction we take with the code to implement our feature. So for instance, we could introduce a conditional indicating to the rest of the team where the new code starts and have this conditional turned off by default. From this moment on, while the rest of the team sees our changes, sees how these changes will affect their work and they can adapt immediately. Now we can argue that introducing a conditional introduces complexity in the code base because we are introducing branching logic. And yes, you are right, it does. On the other hand, not introducing the conditional but using a feature branch doesn't remove the conditional. The conditional is still there. 
but it's absolutely not obvious and absolutely not visible because the conditional from this moment on is our version control branch. And from this moment on, the rest of the team, well, doesn't see our changes. Our changes are invisible for the rest of the team. So now remember, a version control system is not only there to version source code. It's first and foremost a communication tool to communicate changes with the rest of the team and to create a shared understanding and a collective ownership of the code base, which will lead to better quality and higher throughput. Because we are hiding work for the rest of the team, it discourages the adoption of refactoring. <coughs> now, as long as we are adding new code to the code base, integrating these changes is fairly straightforward. But the minute we start refactoring, we are introducing new concepts, new abstractions, and while well, version control systems are simply unaware of semantic changes, and this makes merging quite complicated and time-consuming. So if we have two team members working in parallel, each on their feature, um, and one person refactors and merges first, and the second person has a significant amount of changes on his branch, merging back will be rather painful for that second person, and it might introduce some tension in the team. Now, the longer the branch lives, the more refactoring we perform on the branch, while the harder it becomes to merge back because of all the merge conflicts and all the rework we will have. And so integrating changes becomes time consuming, which will slow down the team. And it is the slowdown of the team that discourages the adoption of, of refactoring. But we all know that if we don't refactor, well, we are not paying back technical debt. And if we are not paying back technical debt, well, adding new functionality to the code base becomes more difficult. And, more, and harder and more time consuming and again the team is going to slow down and so we end up in this vicious circle where the team slows down over time eventually comes to a halt and nobody really understanding how and why this happened now when using branches we are in fact introducing batch work so the longer the branch lived the more changes are accumulated on the branch the bigger the batch size is, where the batch size is the number of commits that exist since the creation of the branch. Now, the bigger the batch size, the more work in progress we have. And work in progress is just inventory. And inventory is money stuck into the system. It is stuck into the system because our organization invested quite a lot of money to create all the code that exists on all of the parallel branches. But it didn't generate any value as long as we haven't merged back into mainline and deployed into production while well, we don't get feedback. It's only the minute that we merge back and deploy and release to our users that we see how this code behaves in production, how it is being used by our users, and that we can start taking new decisions and run new experiments. Now, to reduce this inventory, we know from lean manufacturing we have to reduce work in progress. So this means we have to reduce the lifetime of our branches. So we need to commit more frequently into mainline, integrating our changes more, uh, uh, more frequently, and so achieving a state of continuous integration and get closer to a single piece flow. And we know also from lean manufacturing that a single piece flow will increase throughput, reduce lead time, and reduce time to market. Because feature branches introduce batch work, it also creates bigger change sets. And bigger change sets is just a bigger risk. Um, so if we are committing frequently into mainline, well, the change sets are small. And so our continuous integration process only has to process a small change set. So if the build happens to break, finding the root cause will be fairly easy because the change set is small. And also, probably we've introduced a failing change just five minutes ago. And so we still have enough context to fix that build easily, and so we will be able to fix the build within 10 minutes. On the other hand, if we are using feature branches, well, we are committing less frequently into mainline, and so our continuous integration process will have to process a bigger change set. So if the build happens to break, finding the root cause will be far more difficult because the change set is so big. And also, maybe we've introduced the failing change a couple of hours ago, or worse, a couple of days ago. 
And so we don't have enough context anymore to fix that build quickly and easily. And so we run the risk of having a broken build for a long period of time and we've just, just lost the monitoring of the health of our, of, of, of our application and so we've lost the ability to perform on-demand production releases at any given moment in time which will increase lead time and increase time to market. And lastly it creates cognitive overload. So to start the implementation of a feature we need to create a branch and push the branch to a remote repository. To reduce merge complexity we have to um, rebase mainline onto the branch frequently. To communicate changes between features, well, we have to cherry pick uh, commits from one branch into another. If we have to switch work between features, which is never a good idea, but well, shit happens, we need to uh, switch between branches. And lastly, when the feature is done, we may not forget to delete the branch, <coughs> or we run the risk of having a repository full of branches. Um, so in order to implement a feature, well, a team needs to perform um, lots of operations on a day-to-day -day basis. And so team members have to remember lots of version control system commands, which creates cognitive overload and might slow down the team. Compare this with the simplicity of having everyone in the team committing directly into mainline multiple times a day, reducing redundant work and simplifying the workflow. The only thing we need to do is pulling the latest changes, add our local changes, commit and push and we're done. It's fairly simple. As a result, team members only have to remember a small subset of version control commands. Yeah, for a long time I didn't know how to create a branch in Git. Um, how can we avoid this? So, alright, there are lots of problems, but how can we avoid all these problems? Well, <coughs> by adopting continuous integration as it was meant uh, when introduced by the extreme programming community in the late 90s ensuring always working software on mainline, enabling us to perform on-demand production releases at any given moment in time. This is one of the most critical practices to adopt in order to enable the fast flow of work through our value stream and get us closer to a single piece flow. And this implies the practice of trunk-based development. So trunk-based development is what team members or pairs practice in order for a team to achieve continuous integration. It is a version control strategy where everyone in the team commits multiple times a day into mainline. As a result, change sets are very small, merge conflicts are, the conflicts are very rare and the code base is always in a releasable state. So we can always do production releases at any given moment in time. Testing happens on mainline and ideally releasing happens from mainline. Every release needs, needs some um, stabilization while well, we can create a short-lived release branch and then release from the release branch. But fixes happen on trunk and are uh, cherry-picked into the release branch. So when releasing we can just delete the release branch without merging back into mainline. Now, trunk-based development is really, really not a recent new hype, as I sometimes read on Twitter. So, trunk-based development is actually there since a very long time. It's there since the early 80s, when RCS was introduced as one of the first version control systems. It had support for branches, but teams were very cautious, and so they stuck to trunk. All right, but how can we achieve continuous integration? How do we make sure it doesn't become a mess when everyone in the team is starting to commit directly into mainline multiple times a day? Something most teams are most afraid of. Well, we have several practices at our disposal. Actually, there are 14 practices that make continuous integration. I'm going to share four of them with you because 14 makes a talk on its own. And I actually have a talk. That, that talks about that. Um, and the, first, the first practice is, in my humble opinion, the most important one to adopt, but it seems 
from what I see, it's also well the hardest one to adopt. It's working in small increments. Breaking large changes in a series of small incremental changes, ensuring our system is always working. Um, Steve Freeman and Ed Price make this analogy with uh, surgery in their book Growing Object-Oriented Software Guided by Tess, where they say surgeons prefer keyhole surgery because it is less invasive and it is cheaper, while for the same reasons we like to work in small incremental steps because it's less invasive. We are not ripping apart our systems they are, and therefore they are ch it is cheaper because our systems are always working and we can perform on-demand production releases at any given moment in time. But this means several things. First of all, it means we only commit on green. And this is where test-driven development supports continuous integration. So we start by writing a small failing test. We add just enough production code until the test passes to green and we commit and we push. And then we start refactoring. If the test is red, we revert. If it is green, we commit and we push again. And so test-driven development will create this commit cadence that we need in order to reach continuous integration. Second, we absolutely need a decoupled code base. When the code base is too coupled, it is really, really hard to work in small increments because any change will ripple through all layers of the application, ripping apart the application, making sure the application is not working for a long period of time, and as such disabling us to perform on-demand production releases. And this is why adopting um, architectures like hexagonal architecture, also known as ports and adapters, and principles like the single responsibility principle or dependency injection are so helpful. So this architecture and these principles will not only improve our code base quality, but it will also help in increasing our IT delivery throughput and reducing lead time and time to market. And lastly, we absolutely need lots and lots and lots and lots of very, very, very fast tests. We need lots of tests to gain enough confidence, we are not introducing any regressions when committing frequently into mainline, and they need to be fast in order for us to be able to commit frequently because we need to execute those tests each time we want to, uh, to commit. <coughs> when tests are too slow, two things can happen. Either teams do not execute them, and then they run the risk of introducing regressions when committing into mainline or having a broken build or they tend to run them less frequently and then they start batching up work and we know from batching up work that um, this will um, uh, reduce our feedback and it will have a negative impact on quality and on throughput. The second practice is the easiest one to adopt. If you have unfinished functionality, just hide it. It's perfectly acceptable to have unfinished functionality sitting in production even behind a publicly accessible URL as long as it is not discoverable by the end user and it doesn't introduce any security concerns. So for instance if we are adding a new screen to a user interface as long as the screen is not finished well just don't add a uh, menu entry in our navigation menu. Only add this at the end when the screen is finished. Same is true with um, adding new API endpoints. As long as the API endpoint is not ready, do not document it. No one will know it exists. If you have to perform large-scale refactoring that could take weeks or months and that could rip apart our application um, for a long period of time, let's say we want to upgrade Kubernetes. Yeah, of course, you can upgrade Kubernetes in place, but well, if shit happens, I invite you to roll back, but I don't want to be in the room when you do that. Yeah. Or let's say a more simpler example is like um, you want to rename the security group, which you can't. You can only delete the security group and recreate it. Duh. 
And if it's um, attached to an EC2 instance, well, you can, in, can't even delete it. So instead of using the classic approach of uh, branch by version control, where we create a branch, do the modification, and then roll out, uh, roll out the thing, well, we should adopt expand contract. So expand contract is a practice that allows us to perform large scale refactorings in small incremental steps. And while doing this, keeping the whole application and the whole system still working and still being able to perform um, on-demand production releases and still being able to add new functionality to our systems. From what I see, it seems to be that expand contract is this little gem that few engineers are aware of although it is a very strong enabler of continuous integration, it's one of the most important practices to adopt in order to work in small incremental steps. How does it work? Okay, so let's say we want to upgrade Kubernetes. Crazy idea. So we start from a situation where we have a cluster with lots of services and lots of DNS records pointing to those services. So the first thing we are going to do is create a second cluster with the new version, next to the old cluster, with the old version. So we now have two clusters, the old cluster with lots of services and the new cluster with empty. Our system is still working and we can still perform on-demand uh, on production releases at any given moment in time. This is called the expand phase. We have expanded the code base and our systems with an additional cluster. Then we start to gradually move services from the old cluster to the new cluster. And each time we move a, a service, well, we can commit. And each time we can perform uh, production releases at, uh, at any given moment in time. And lastly, when the old cluster is empty and the new cluster has all the services, well, we can safely remove the old cluster without breaking the system. This is called the contract phase. We are contracting the code base and our system by removing a cluster. Now, evolutionary database changes like renaming columns, moving columns between tables, splitting columns into two columns, um, renaming tables, are also examples of um, expand contract. Um, introducing a v2 API alongside a v1 API with different URLs is another example of expand contract. Blue-green deployments is expand contract for deployments. So we start with one version in production, then we add a second version, the blue version, um, and then we have the old version, which is the green version. We keep blue and green running at the same time until we, uh, we think that blue is good enough, and then we take away green. Now, I have to admit that this adds quite some complexity to our code bases and to our systems. And that we will have to think harder and that we will move slower. But it has the enormous advantage of never breaking the flow of work through our, uh, our value stream. We are never blocking the addition of new functionality <coughs> to our systems while we are doing um, this refactoring. And as a last resort, we have feature toggles. Um, feature toggles allows us to decouple um, code deployment from feature release, which is called dark launching. So we are going to deploy code changes into production days or weeks in advance before releasing to the end user. Now it allows us that we can actually test this code in production while it is invisible for the user and while it doesn't impact the user. And we can even test with production load by having user sessions perform invisible calls to the new feature. It also allows us to perform um, canary releases where we gradually release to the user base. We start with a small user base, we check if everything works correctly and then we start by increasing the user base. If it starts to work badly, well, we can roll back at runtime by turning off the feature, which is far less risky than having to redeploy an old version. Now, in my humble opinion, this is the last resort. We should first master working in small incremental steps, hiding functionality, and expand contract before jumping into feature toggles, because, well, feature toggles come with its fair share of problems. Um, it's very easy to shoot oneself in the foot when, ba when managed badly, like what happened with Knight Capital Services. Um, so Knight Capital Group was a financial services uh, company 
um, that was the biggest trader in US equities on the uh, NASDAQ and the New York Stock Exchange that managed to lose $460 million in 45 minutes and went bankrupt because they reused a feature toggle between two releases but gave it a different meaning <coughs> and they did manual deployments on eight servers and they forgot to deploy on one of eight servers. Whoops. So there was one server running the old version using the old meaning of the toggle. So, like with work in progress, we want to limit the number of active feature toggles. As soon as a toggle is not needed, it is removed from the code base as soon as possible. Um, otherwise, we run the risk of having a code base with lots of toggles, no one knowing wherefore they are used, no one daring to remove them. Um, toggles need to be independent from each other. Um, so, one feature, one toggle. Don't have a situation that to turn on a feature, we need to turn on toggle X, turn off toggle Y, and turn on toggle Z again. It's an insane uh, uh, situation. It, 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 it's very difficult to test, it's very difficult to reason about this. No, one, one feature, one toggle. When we say toggle, we say branching logic. Branching logic needs to be tested, so we need to execute our automated tests against the systems um, with both the toggle on and off. And lastly, when we say branching logic, we say complexity, maintainability problems. Um, so there are different ways on how to implement um, uh, toggles. Not all of them are good. Pete Hodgson wrote a, a good article um, that, that describes how to um, implement toggles in a maintainable way. It's called Feature Toggles and it's available on Martin Fowler's Blicky. Pete Hodgson also wrote uh, a couple of um, interesting articles on managing toggles on, on, the, block, uh, 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 on the block of Split.io. Now, whenever I suggest string based development, there is always this single question that I always get asked. What about code reviews? How do we do code reviews? Yeah, I know. Uh, I see the timer. Um, how do we do code reviews when we don't have a branch? Well, first of all, code reviews are not mandatory. It's an option. It's a decision of your team. Many teams think that uh, because they do code reviews, they are mature because it is a best practice. Well, it is seen as a best, best practice. Well, if your team is really mature, well, you could expect they will do the right thing, and so we don't need this extra approval uh, step. If we still want to do code reviews, well, the first solution, the most easy one, is pair programming or sampler programming, because it gives us uh, code reviews continuously. Code is being reviewed while it is being written before it's committed on mainline. And Dave Farley reported this is good enough as code reviews for highly regulated industries like finance, healthcare, gambling industry. If, you, if we don't do pair programming or ensemble programming, or we still want a formal uh, code review, well, we have still two post-commit uh, options. And the first one is the most known one and the most use, used one, is the pull request model. But this time with short-lived branches. Now, honestly, I've never seen this work. Although many people I, I really respect gave me positive feedback that it does work. Now, my biggest concern is, um, first of all, the branch lives longer than expected um, because of the ping pong that happens between reviewer and reviewee. Reviewer not available, reviewee not available. And most importantly, it blocks the flow of work through our value stream. It blocks the delivery of a feature until the feature has been approved. And lastly, um, we have the non-blocking code review, where commits will be reviewed after the fact on mainline. Um, I had a very good experience working this way with this novice team I've introduced in, uh, at the start of, of, of uh, this presentation. So it might happen, so the biggest advantage is, is we are not never blocking a feature. So features can be deployed whether they have been reviewed or not. And it might happen that, 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 that the feature is only reviewed when it is in production. Now we can argue that there is a risk of introducing bad code quality, 
um, in, in production, and yes, this will happen for sure. And I don't see a problem over there because bad quality is not a bug. And code reviews are not there to catch bugs. For this, we have automated tests. But this can only work if we have team commitment that all commits will be reviewed and that uh, whenever uh, a code review issue is found, it is fixed with highest priority so that it is removed <coughs> out of production as soon as possible. Now, I'm coming to the end, sorry. Um, what are the benefits of trunk based development? Well, if we are committing more frequently into mainline, we are going to create more frequent builds. And if we can create more frequent builds, well, we can deploy more frequently into production. And as a result, while we are increasing throughput, reducing lead time, and reducing time to market. Um, now, if we can deploy more frequently into production, well, we can also run more experiments. And so we can find more unmet needs of our customers and find more ways to delight our customers, which will increase customer satisfaction um, exponentially. If we are building more frequently, um, we will be able to uncover um, more problems um, earlier, allowing us to fix them immediately and as such um, build quality into the product instead of having to test the quality in the product later, which will lead to better stability and better quality. So trend-based development predicts better quality, better stability and higher throughput. And this has been confirmed by the 2016 uh, peer-reviewed academic paper The Role of Continuous uh, Delivery in IT and Organizational Performance by Dr. Nicole Falsgren and Jess Humble and uh, the book Accelerate by the same authors and Gene Kim where they found out that trend-based development together with continuous integration um, are statistically significant predictors of adopting continuous delivery and continu continuous delivery is a predictor of um, higher IT delivery performance and together with the adoption of lean product management and a generative organizational culture will predict higher organizational performance like money-wise, generating more revenue, more market share. <coughs> now where's the evilness? You've never mentioned the evilness. Well, the evilness is not so much the problems that are introduced by the use of feature branches, but the evilness hides behind the use of feature branches. What are the real problems or the real reasons that team are using um, feature branches for, which is not necessarily the reasons that proponents of feature branching shared with me at the start of this presentation. Now, in my um, humble experience, well, the real reasons are there is a lack of incremental software engineering skills in the team. Or the code base is just too coupled, preventing the team to adopt incremental software engineering skills. Or there is just a lack in automated tests, um, which prevents the team to gain enough confidence of not introducing new questions when committing frequently into mainline. Or the build is just too slow, preventing the team to commit frequently into, into mainline because they have to run that build each time they commit into, um, into mainline. So feature branching is more like a symptom treatment and not really a solution to a root cause. Um, and it tends to hide the real problems of teams, whereas if teams adopt trunk based development, it will uncover the, these problems and force these teams to actually do something about it. Does it mean that trunk based development is easy? It is not. It is quite hard, quite difficult. It, it, it was like, well, for us software engineers, um, like adopting test-driven development. It was difficult to move on. So it requires a mindset shift. Many engineers think it cannot possibly work in their environment, in their context, so they are very skeptical. And from my experience, it requires a lot of energy to um, try to get a team to run an experiment with trunk based development, especially if you are alone in front of, uh, of six or ten engineers. But once they try an experiment, once, once they start trying trunk based development, and they start to see the benefits, and they start to see how much simpler the workflow becomes, they cannot imagine another world using branches anymore. Thank you for your time. <laughs>